Hey guys, what's up? It's Savannah. Welcome back to my channel and welcome back to another true crime episode here on my YouTube channel. Hope you guys are having a good day. I hope you're staying safe. I hope you are staying inside if you can and if you are working and if you are an essential worker, thank you. I am with you. My heart is with you. I hope you are staying safe as well. So as you can tell by the title of today's video, you guys, today we are talking about the case of Pamela Smart. So if you are interested in the true crime world, you may or may not have heard about this case. It was a very, very popular case when this happened back in the 90s. There was a lot of media coverage on it when it happened and it is still one that gets a decent amount of media coverage to this day. This was a case that I had always heard about. I had briefly known about it, but it wasn't until I recently did all of my research and, and discovered all the things I'm going to be sharing with you today where I really understood it. Before we get started, I do want to thank today's sponsor for this video and that is Causebox. So if you've never heard of Causebox, Causebox is a quarterly subscription service that is filled with products that are ethical, sustainable, and that have a mission to to give back into the world. Every box comes with six to eight full size products that are valued at $250. Some of my favorite things that have come in the cause box are my jade roller because I love a good skincare routine, as well as a duffel bag, a bento box so you could take food on the go, as well as a portfolio clutch. The last four boxes with cause box have sold out within days, which I completely believe because you're getting a values worth of $250 for only $50 with cause box. Getting yourself a cause box is like the perfect little surprise. When you buy things online, you typically know what you're getting, you know what you're ordering, but with Causebox, it's a complete surprise and you kind of just get to gift yourself. So if you guys go to www.causebox.com slash killer instinct and use the code killer instinct at checkout, you will get 30% off your first Causebox, which means that you will get a box that is valued at $250 for only $39 and that includes free shipping. Again, that is just www.causebox.com slash killer instinct and use the code killer instinct at checkout. I will have the link for Causebox in the description box below so you guys can go check them out. I know you will not be disappointed and with that being said, let's move on to the rest of today's episode. So like I said, today we are talking about Pamela Smart. Now if you are unfamiliar with who Pamela Smart is, Pamela Smart is a woman who was convicted of witness tampering, conspiracy to commit murder, as well as accomplice to first degree murder for the murder of her husband Greg Smart in 1990. Now I always feel the need to put a disclaimer at this part of the episode because this is where we're going to talk about Pamela's upbringing. And the reason I like to do that is because I personally like to know whenever I read into these cases, how did we get here? I am just always genuinely curious to know what led us to this point. So Pamela Smart was born on August 16th, 1967 to her parents, John and Linda Wojas in Coral Gables, Florida. Pamela is one of three children. She has a sister as well as a brother. Her mother growing up was a homemaker, so she was always home taking care of the kids. And Pamela has described her upbringing as a very positive environment. According to Pamela, she said if she ever had a problem or if she ever needed to talk to someone, if she ever just needed her mom, she never had to wait for her mom to come home to work. Her mom was always home. Pamela's father was a pilot, so he was gone a lot traveling, but Pamela and her dad had a great relationship. And after living in Florida for a while with her family, her family decided that it was time to move. I'm not sure why they necessarily decided to move. I'm not sure what the cause of the move was, but I do know that they ended up moving from Florida to New Hampshire. In New Hampshire is where Pamela did a lot of her growing up years. She went to high school in New Hampshire, but once it came time for college and enrolling in a university, Pamela decided that she wanted to go back to Florida. So she went back to Florida after she graduated and enrolled in the Florida State University. Pamela was extremely busy during her college years. She was working three different jobs while in college, as well as trying to get her degree in communications, which she did, and she ended up graduating a year early. Pamela wanted to be a television news reporter. That's what she wanted to do. It was her dream job. But one of the jobs that she did have while she was in college was working at a radio show. She was a DJ on the radio show. And after DJing for a while, she earned her name Maiden of Metal. And that was because of the type of music she liked to play. She loved playing metal music, obviously. That's where the name came from, as well as a lot of rock music. So now let's talk a little bit about Pamela's love life. So because she was so busy all the time, in college. She never really had the chance to date. She never had any boyfriends. She always just said that she was too busy. She was working three jobs. She was trying to graduate, which she did a year early. She never really went to parties. She never had that college experience that a lot of people want where you're going out to frat parties and sorority parties. That was never it for Pamela. She was always working or studying one or the other. But all of that changed when she met Greg Smart. Greg Smart was born on September 4th, 1965. So he was two years older than Pamela and he lived 
lived in New Hampshire. Now in 1986, Pamela left Florida to go back home to New Hampshire for Christmas break. And it was at a New Year's Eve party during Christmas break where she met Greg Smart and the two of them hit it off right away. One of the main things that they bonded over was that they both really had the same taste in music. Greg also loved the rock and roll metal type of music that Pamela loved and Greg really looked the part of a rock and roller. It was like the stereotypical look. He had the long hair, he played guitar, he had that like rocker fashion sense at the time and Pamela loved it. It was one of the main things that initially attracted her to him. Him. and Greg was really Pamela's first relationship ever. He was her first boyfriend and they actually ended up getting married two years after they started dating and that was when Pamela was 21 years old and Greg was 23 years old. So just to kind of give you a perception of who Greg is, based off of all the research that I did, no one had a bad word to say about Greg. Everyone seemed to love him. They said he was the funniest guy, super outgoing, just the kind of guy you want to be around. And Pamela's family also loved him, loved the two of them together, thought it was a great relationship and while some thought their relationship did move a little bit on the quicker side everyone just thought that Pamela and Greg were a great fit for each other so Greg and Pamela got married on May 7th 1989 and after they got married the two of them ended up moving back to New Hampshire because before they had got married Greg ended up moving to Florida with Pamela to be with her and then after they got married the two of them went back to New Hampshire and they ended up moving into a town called Derry New Hampshire and Pamela actually got a job as a media coordinator at the Winnicunit High School in Hampton, New Hampshire. Now this job seemed like the great stepping stone for her. It was like the perfect job to kind of lead her on the path that she wanted to go with, with potentially being a news reporter for television. It seemed like the perfect first step for her. And while Pamela was working at the high school, Greg actually got into the insurance business with his father. And he worked a lot on selling insurance to other people. So he was constantly making house calls to other people. Sometimes it was during the day, sometimes it was at night, and he was trying to sell insurance to other people. So a lot of people would think just based off of what I told you that Greg and Pamela were really on the right path to starting their lives together. But that was not the case. Once the two of them got the jobs, they got the house, reality started to set in very, very quickly. And that is when Pamela and Greg's relationship started having a lot of problems behind closed doors. Now the reality of their situation ended up hitting Pamela very hard. And what I mean by that is that Pamela was hit with the reality that she was no longer dating, is long-haired rock star looking guy who played guitar and who was in a band. She was now married to a man who sells insurance and cut his hair to look more professional. And while a lot of these things wouldn't bother other people, they really did have an effect on Pamela. Now, according to Pamela, she said a couple months into her and Greg's marriage, Greg ended up having an affair. According to Pamela, she said that Greg told her that he was going out with a friend that night to grab a couple of drinks and just hang out, have kind of like a guy's night. Greg also told Pamela that he spent the night at this friend house because it ended up getting too late. He was drinking a lot. He just wanted to just spend the night at the friend's house, sleep it off, and go home in the morning. Now, according to Pamela, she said that is not what happened. According to Pamela, Greg confessed to her that instead of going home with a friend that night, he actually ended up going home with another woman and spending the night at her house. Pamela said that when she was told this, she was, of course, absolutely devastated. She was heartbroken. She thought it was her fault. Her self-esteem hit an all-time low. But here's the thing about this affair. A lot of people actually don't believe that this affair happened. A lot of people think that Pamela used this affair as an excuse to kind of justify some of her actions that we're gonna talk about in a second. Because based off of everything that I have seen, there is no evidence to prove that Greg did or did not have this affair. And a lot of people just don't trust Pamela in general, so they don't trust when she says that Greg had an affair. So let's talk about the night of May 1st, 1990. So at this point, Pamela and Greg had been married for a little over a year. And on this particular night, Pamela actually had a board meeting at her school, so she was not able to come home until a little bit later. And by the time she got home, it was about 10 o'clock p.m., and when she walked in through the door of her home, she saw Greg lying on the floor, dead in the entryway. Now, right when Pamela saw this, she ran out the door, started knocking on all the neighbors' doors, telling them to call 911, and that's when multiple different neighbors ended up calling 911, and police arrived. Now, when police arrived on the scene and they saw Greg, they noticed that he had been shot from a single gunshot wound to the back of his head. So Greg was basically killed execution style and police had no idea where to start in this investigation. Everything was a big question mark. They had no idea why a guy who seemed like he had his entire life ahead of him, why a guy who seemed like he had everything going for him ended up murdered. So let's talk about Greg and Pamela's house. So when police walked into Greg
Greg and Pamela's home and they saw Greg, they also were able to notice that their house was destroyed. It looked like it had been completely ransacked. There were random drawers pulled out all over the house from different cabinets. There were CDs all over the floor. There had been pillowcases that had been ripped open and the stuffing from the pillowcases was everywhere. And they lived in a two-story house. And even though Greg was found on the first story in the entryway of the house, the second story was just as badly ransacked. So this did look like a robbery gone wrong to police initially. But what police found interesting was that even though this did look like a robbery gone wrong, they noticed that there were two things left behind and that was Greg's wallet as well as his gold wedding band. Now you would think if someone was going to rob someone, they want to take the most valuable things, right? They want to take the expensive stuff. So why leave his wallet, which had been untouched, as well as his gold wedding band. That did not make a lot of sense to police whatsoever. There was also no forced entry and no sign of a break-in on Pamela and Greg's home. And I also want to point out that they didn't live in a bad neighborhood. Police actually came forward after Greg's murder and said that it is incredibly unusual for there to be a robbery that includes a firearm in the district that they lived in. So right from the get-go, this case did get a decent amount of media coverage. Like I said in the beginning, everyone was just extremely confused. This case made no sense to anyone. And just six days after Greg's murder, Pamela decided that she was going to go on the TV news station. Now, she said that the reason that she did this was to tell people about Greg and let people know who Greg was and the type of person that he was and to get the word out because this case was still unsolved. And a lot of people gave Pamela a lot of criticism for this interview that she did. And that is mainly because in this interview, Pamela had a, a full face of makeup on. Her hair was completely done. She was wearing this nice dress. She had her dog sitting with her. A lot of people questioned questioned why she looked so put together, why she made her appearance look so good. And there are two ways you can look at this. The first way was people really questioned why she was going and doing this interview only six days after her husband's murder, looking completely made up and dolled up. Or the other option, which was this is just a woman who wants to get the word out about her husband's murder, wants people to sympathize with her and with him. That way they're more inclined to help find out who did this to her husband. There's two ways that you can take it. So I'm interested to see which way you guys think. But because of the intent criticism that Pamela got from this interview. She has come out since then and said that the reason that she did this interview is because there was a TV news reporter. The news reporter that she did the interview with was basically pressuring her into doing this interview because she said that the news reporter told her that he had heard a story about Greg having a gambling problem and he was going to run with it if she didn't make a comment. And Pamela said because of that, she felt pressured and felt like she had to do this interview. Now the news reporter has come out and said that that never happened. He never pressured Pamela into doing anything and that Pamela actually reached out to him. So now we're about six weeks after Greg Sparts' murder, and this is still an unsolved case. Police still have no leads, no suspects. They have no idea what happened to Greg. That all changed on June 10th, 1990. So on this particular day, there was a man who walked into the police department holding a gun, and he walked up to the police officer, and he shows the officer the gun, and he says, this is my gun, and I think it was used in the Greg Smart murder. Now, weirdly enough, this man wasn't even at the Derry Police Department. He was at the Seabrook Police Department, which is about 40 miles away from Derry. And remember, Greg and Pamela lived in Derry. That's where their house was. That's where the murder happened. And that was the police department that was working on their case. So for someone to walk into a different police department in Seabrook, which is 40 miles away and say that I have the gun and I think that this is the gun used in Greg Smart's murder, it was very, very shocking and confusing to police. So police wanted to know why this man thought that he had the gun that killed Greg Smart. Now, according to police, this man had said that he had recently gone to retrieve his gun. And when he did that, he noticed that it had been freshly cleaned and he knew that he had not cleaned it. So he thought it was a little odd. And on top of that, this man has a teenage son and this man had overheard his teenage son talking to a friend. And this friend had told his son that he believes that his dad's gun could have been used in the Greg Smart murder. So this man's son's friend is a boy named Ralph Welch. So the first thing that police did is that they wanted to compare the bullets that were in the gun that this man had brought in and the bullet that was found in Greg Smart's head. Now, when they did this, it was a perfect match. So police actually now had the murder weapon, which was a huge break in the case. And the next thing that police did, which they actually did the same day on June 10th, is they brought Ralph Welch in for questioning because they wanted to know how in the world he knew that this gun was used in Greg Smart's murder. And when police brought Ralph Welch in for questioning, he did not hold anything back. 
Ralph Welch told the police that he knew who was responsible for Greg Smart's murder. According to him, he said that the three boys that were responsible for Greg Smart's murder were Billy Flynn, Patrick Randall, and Vance Latame Jr. So these three boys, Billy, Patrick, and Vance, were all in high school, and they had all had their own fair share in trouble in the law. They were minor offenses, but police knew the names of these people when Ralph Welch told them. According to Ralph, he said that Vance waited in the car while Billy and Patrick waited inside the house for Greg. According to Ralph, he said that Greg did try to escape once he was attacked in his own home by Billy and Patrick. However, Billy and Patrick got a hold of him and Patrick held Greg's head while Billy shot him in the back of his skull. Ralph said that the ransacking in the house was to stage it to make it look like there had been a robbery. So now within the same day, police have the murder weapon and three names of potential suspects who could have killed Greg Smart. But now police wanted a motive. They wanted to know why in the world these three boys would go out of their way to murder Greg Smart. But Ralph Welch had the answer to that question too. And according to him, he said that each boy was offered $500 to murder Greg Smart. Now I'm sure you could guess who they said they were getting this money from. That would be Pamela Smart. So according to Ralph, he's saying that the boys were told by Pamela that if they kill Greg, she will give them $500 each. So this was a complete bombshell in this case. This is where police were completely thrown off. Everyone was just shocked that Pamela was being brought into this, but police couldn't just go by the word of Ralph Welch, who was a 16 year old boy. They needed to do more investigating and they needed more evidence. So police went back to that TV interview that Pamela had done six days after Greg's murder and they started to comb through it in a little bit more detail. And they realized that there were some very questionable things that Pamela said in this interview. According to police, Pamela knew a lot more details than she basically would if she had nothing to do with Greg's murder. There are details that police just say Pamela would not have known and the fact that she does know them are very questionable because once police arrived on the scene, obviously Greg and Pamela's home was treated like a crime scene. So police blocked off the entire house, didn't let Pamela in the house. And one could argue that Pamela had time before the police got there to walk through the house, but that did make police question a couple things. And the second thing is that in reference to Greg's murder, Murder, Pamela said that Greg's murder couldn't have happened at a better time. Now that is just a weird thing to say about your husband who has just died, but Pamela has defended her statement in saying that by saying that what she meant is that it was way better for Greg to die a year after they got married versus 20 years after they got married because her love for Greg would have only been that much stronger if it were 20 years down the line versus one year. But even though those are weird things to say, that doesn't mean that someone is a murderer. That doesn't mean that someone plotted to kill their husband. It wasn't enough evidence for police. So police were looking for the connection between the three boys and Pamela, and it didn't take long for them to get it. Police were able to quickly figure out that Billy, Patrick, and Vance were all students at the Winnicunit High School, which is where Pamela works. Pamela was first introduced to one of the boys, Billy Flynn, after she started this Project Self Esteem. And what that was, was a group that Pamela organized where kids would come in and talk about their problems, talk about things they were struggling with, whether it was family problems, school problems, drug problems, just to really come together and feel like they had a safe space. Now, Pamela and Billy met each other in this group. So just from a police standpoint, this was a light bulb for the police because that puts Billy and Pamela in the same room together and a lot of time to get to know each other. So now we have someone new that gets thrown into so now we have someone new that gets thrown into the mix, and that person is a girl named Cecilia Pierce. So Cecilia was also a student at the Winnicunit High School, and she was also a part of the self-esteem project. Now, police had actually received an anonymous tip from someone. Now, the person who called in this tip said that Pamela orchestrated Greg's murder, said she was the mastermind behind it all. She told those three boys to murder her husband. Now, the anonymous caller also said that the person who could give them all the information that they needed was Cecilia Pierce. So police brought Cecilia in for questioning and according to Cecilia, she said that her and Pamela were extremely close. Cecilia looked to Pamela as a big sister. They cared about each other, they hung out, they were friends. Cecilia then told police that Pamela was very open with her about her relationship with Billy Flynn. Cecilia told police that Pamela had told her that she was in love with Billy, and Cecilia also said that she had actually walked in 
on Pamela and Billy having sex. So now police had Pamela who was having an affair with Billy and Billy was the one who killed and actually pulled the trigger on Greg Pamela's husband. Cecilia also told the police that she had heard conversations that Billy and Pamela were having every single day leading up to Greg's murder about what the plan was going to be, how it was going to happen, and Pamela basically demanding that Billy did this for her. Cecilia admitted that Pamela was the mastermind behind this. Pamela was the one who wanted Billy to do this and basically threatened Billy and her's relationship if he didn't do this for her. Now, I want to point out, like I said, Billy and the other two boys were in high school but they were 16 years old. So after Cecilia admitted everything that she did to the police, the police actually used Cecilia to try and get more information out of Pamela. They wanted the most information that they could get, the more information, the better. So they ended up wiring her and they told her to walk into Pamela's office and try to have a conversation with her, see if she would open up about anything else. So after Cecilia was wired up and mic'd up, she walked into Pamela's office and that is when the two of them had a conversation. Cecilia had told told Pamela police were questioning her and thought that Pamela could be responsible for this and that they're trying to pin it on her. Now, instead of denying it and saying, why would they ever think that? Of course, I would never do anything like that. Pamela actually tells Cecilia that she needs to lie to the police because if she tells the truth, not only will she be sending Billy, Patrick, and Vance to jail for the rest of their lives, she will be sending Pamela to jail for the rest of her lives as well and that Cecilia will also be arrested for accessory to murder. So based off of all of the information that they had, police decided that they had enough to go off of to arrest Pamela. Pamela Smart was arrested on August 1st, 1990 for the murder of her husband, Greg Smart. So all three of the boys, Billy, Patrick, and Vance were also arrested. And I do wanna mention that there was another boy in the car with Vance, but according to him, the boys and the police, Raymond was not a part of this plan. He was just kind of in the wrong place at the wrong time, but he did end up getting arrested as well just for being in the car and being there and not coming forward to police. But the reason I didn't bring him up in the beginning is just because with everywhere that you look, his name is rarely mentioned. I don't really know why because he technically was there, but according to everyone, he did not know that this murder was happening and the other three boys did and that was the main difference. So when it came to Pamela's arrest, everything was based off of circumstantial evidence. Police didn't have any physical evidence or anything like that to prove that Pamela was the mastermind behind all of this. And at this point, none of the boys were talking either. And this was because they assumed that because they were only 16 years old, that even if they did go to jail because of their age, they would be released by the time they were 18 years old. Now, when police found out that this was their kind of like plan in their head, they ended up telling the boys that they were going to be tried as adults and could be facing the rest of their lives in prison. So then the boys started talking because they figured that if they were able to help give the police what they wanted, maybe it would lessen their sentence. So they all ended up pleading guilty and it actually did end up lessening their sentence, which we'll get into to later, but all of the boys pled guilty and then they started talking. Now, according to Vance, the one who was in the car, he said that Bill had told him and Patrick that Pamela had told Bill. So you have Pamela telling Bill this, who tells the boys this. Pamela told Bill that her and Greg couldn't get a divorce because if that were to happen, Greg would take all of their money and all of their assets and Pamela would be left with nothing. According to Vance, he said one day him and Billy walked into Pamela's office at school and Pamela was on the phone with Greg screaming screaming and arguing and Pamela put the phone on speaker so Vance and Billy could hear the conversation. And once Pamela and Greg hung up the phone, Pamela looked at Billy and said, now you see why I have to have it done. So now let's talk about the trial. This was the trial that was going to prove whether or not Pamela was innocent or if she was guilty. It was going to prove whether or not the boys were just trying to protect themselves and using Pamela as a defense shield or if Pamela was the puppeteer behind all of this. And all three boys ended up testifying against Pamela. And the first one to take the stand was Patrick. According to Patrick, he said on the day of Greg's murder, Pamela told him that she was going to be leaving both doors unlocked. That way the boys could get into the house before Greg got home and wait for him in there. Patrick said that Pamela told him to make it look like there was a robbery and that they could take anything that they wanted. But Patrick said that the two things that Pamela told them that they weren't allowed to do was that they weren't allowed to hurt their dog 
dog or get any blood on the couch. According to Patrick, he said him and Billy waited inside the home until Greg got home. And once Greg got into the house, Billy jumped on Greg and grabbed him. And that is when Greg started screaming and trying to get out of the house. Greg then begged the boys not to hurt the dog. And according to Patrick, he told Greg to hand over his gold wedding band. But Patrick said that Greg refused to do so and that he said that if he did, his wife would kill him. Now, the second of the boys to take the stand was Vance. Now, according to Vance, he said that Pamela asked him how she was supposed to react when she got home to see Greg murdered before it actually happened. She asked the boys if she should run house to house and knock on everyone's doors, if she should just call 911 herself. She wanted to know what would be the most believable. Now, then you have Billy who takes the stand and this is what everyone was really waiting for because it had already been exploited in the media that Pamela and Billy were having a relationship or having an affair, but Billy was the one that everyone was waiting for. Everyone wanted to hear what Billy had to say. Now, according to Billy, he said that him and Pamela had gotten close through the self-esteem project. They would hang out together, and over time, their relationship turned romantic. According to Billy, he said that Pamela told him the only way that the two of them were going to be together was if they killed Greg. And again, just like the other boys did, Billy then played out the night of the murder, explained what happened, explained that he was the one who actually pulled the trigger. And out of all of the boys, Billy was by far the most most emotional one to take the stand. He was visibly upset. He was crying. He kept pulling on his collar. The other two boys weren't very emotional, especially Patrick. Patrick wasn't very emotional at all on the stand. A lot of people said that he seemed very cold and just standoffish and very emotionless. But according to Pamela, she said that while she was sitting there and watching Billy get visibly upset and crying and looking at the jury and watching the jury look at Billy and watching the jury, basically what Pamela said was like eating up whatever Billy had to say. They felt bad for him. They felt sympathy for him and according to Pamela she said that she just wanted to get up and scream at that point that he was faking this whole thing because remember Pamela is maintaining her innocence this entire time she's saying that she had absolutely nothing to do with this and on day nine of the trial it was the defense's turn to make their case now they actually did something a little bit shocking and they actually had Pamela take the stand now according to Pamela's attorney he said that Pamela wanted to take the stand because he said that she wanted to show people who she really was she wanted people to hear her side of the story but that all basically backfired on her because she got annihilated while being cross-examined by the prosecution. So the defense was basically arguing that Pamela and Billy had an affair. They didn't deny that, but they said that Pamela ended up breaking up with Billy because she didn't want to be with him and she wanted to be with Greg. And Billy basically killed Greg in retaliation, out of spite, and for revenge against Pamela. So once the trial was over and the verdict came back, Pamela Smart was found guilty of conspiracy to commit murder witness tampering, and accomplice to first-degree murder. Pamela was actually sentenced literally minutes after her verdict was read. They didn't have like a separate sentencing date or anything like that. After it was read, Pamela Smart is guilty. The judge sentenced her right then and there, didn't even hesitate and gave her a life sentence without the possibility of parole. As far as the boys go, Billy and Patrick both received 25 years, Vance received 15 years, and Raymond received 12 years. And like I said, this was in the 90s, so they have all been released since this. Now here's the thing, this case is technically solved. There was a verdict, there was a sentencing, Pamela Smart is sentenced to jail for the rest of her life. There are a lot of people out there who think that Pamela was innocent in this. They think that she was framed, that the boys used her, like I said, as a defense shield for them. A lot of people believe that this was an unfair trial because either Pamela was a woman or because a lot of people think that Pamela was found guilty way before the trial even started, so she wasn't even given a fair trial. And a lot of people have made the argument stating, you know, the boys who actually, you know, committed the physical act of murder, they've all been released, but Pamela Pamela is going to be in jail for the rest of her life and she was only like six years older than them. People have made the argument that there are multiple female murderers out there who have actually done the physical act of killing someone and received lesser sentences than Pamela did. I think that there is something to be said for the fact that the boys were released from prison and Pamela is going to be in prison for the rest of her life, but you do also have to take into consideration that Pamela was having a relationship with a 16 year old, so there still is that component to it as well. And even though she is in jail, Pamela has said, I am not responsible 
responsible for this. I did not do this. I was falsely accused. There have been multiple movies based off of this case that you guys can go watch. I know Nicole Kidman starred in one of them. She played Pamela Smart. I'm just really interested to see what you guys think about all of this. Do you think that Pamela is guilty or that she's innocent? And if you do think that she was guilty, do you think that she should still be in jail for this? Do you think that the boys should still be in jail for this? Because the boys were the one who committed the physical act of it, but Pamela was the mastermind behind it. And all of the boys have come forward and said that they would have never done this if Pamela didn't tell them to do it. So let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. And with that being said, you guys, that is all for me today. Thank you so much for tuning in to another true crime video here on my channel. If you're new here, hi, my name's Savannah. I make videos three days a week, Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday. You should subscribe and join the family. I love you guys so much. I'll be back in a couple days with a brand new video. Bye guys.